Hello, I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Wired, and it is my great pleasure to be here with the CEO and president of NASDAQ, Adina Friedman. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? I am doing very, very well. All right, let me start with the first question about the future. You started, if I have your bio correct, 27 years ago as an intern at NASDAQ. So tell me a little bit about what NASDAQ will look like in 27 years, and also which of the recently hired interns will likely become the CEO? <laughs> well, any of the recently hired interns have a chance to become the CEO. Uh, but in terms of what NASDAQ will look like in 27 years, or really what exchanges will look like in 27 years, I would expect that we will be ever more connected across the world. We'll have more of a common and scalable infrastructure that supports the exchange industry, likely to be embracing the cloud um, and have essentially the entire market infrastructure as a cloud-based uh, technology. I think the second thing is that you'll see machine learning and machine intelligence as an integral part of every element of the capital markets. And, uh, and then obviously there could be the introduction of quantum by then. So that'll be a, another game changer that the industry is just starting to grapple with in 27 years. That is a lot that's going to happen in the next 27 years. I suspect a couple of those trends are going to happen actually in the next three to five years. Let's start with cloud. What do you think the time scale is before the major exchanges across the world are entirely in the cloud? So I think that there is a future where you could see the, the majority of the larger exchanges being cloud-based technologies within the next 10 years. So I think that that's a, probably a decade long journey because if we look at our own journey, we have developed a new technology using a microservice architecture. We're now rolling that, that technology out through our markets. Now they're still being hosted on-prem in in, with that technology, but they are it's a cloud native technology that allows us then to uh, work with the cloud providers to bring our products are our markets into the cloud. Now, ours are among the harder ones to do that with because of the latency environment. We operate in an environment where trading occurs in fewer than 20 microseconds. So we have to have the ability to develop that and, 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 and manage that in a distributed architecture. And that's, that's the big engineering challenge that we're working through. But I would also say that the cloud providers have a lot of solutions that they're putting in place to enable that going forward. So we, have, we expect our own markets to be migrating over the next five to seven years um, into a cloud environment. And that will then of course pave the way for other markets to embrace it as well. And we do provide the technology to 130 other markets. So we do have the ability to demonstrate if we can do it, then we can hopefully provide it to others as well. Let me understand a little bit more about the latency question. So the moment at which an exchange is ready to migrate entirely to the cloud is when latency to the cloud beats that mark, beats the 20 microseconds mark, or when latency to the cloud is equivalent to latency on-prem, since presumably latency on-prem will accelerate too. Yeah, I would say that you have to meet or beat, right? So I think that it's more a matter of making sure we don't degrade performance by creating and embracing a distributed architecture, but rather that we at least meet the performance requirements that we have today. And then we also get other benefits, right? So you know, there's gotta be a, a, a return for our shareholders, a return for our, our, our clients in terms of knowing that they can connect into a more um, scalable and flexible infrastructure. We probably will have um, less, uh, less, you know, I would say very expensive, but also um, in, in network infrastructure that exists today. And so we want to make it so that the cloud enables more participants to come in, that it's easier to connect in and get started as a, as a client, as a market participant in a cloud environment, that the API environment is more standardized and that they also have the benefit over time of having that same scalable infrastructure available in other markets so that they can take their business and connect into other exchanges relatively seamlessly. So that's, that's the nirvana that we're creating. And then once they're there, the performance is at least equivalent to what we could do on-prem. So creating nirvana, excellent. In this particular nirvana, there also happen to be some bad guys wandering around Nirvana and, you know, wearing black gloves and, you know, black face masks. What do you do to make sure that security in the cloud matches security on-prem? Different challenges, different solutions. Yeah. So I think there are a few things. First of all, the cloud providers themselves have a security framework that's extremely advanced because they see everything and they see it early. Uh, we also, frankly, see a lot and we see it early. So we do have an understanding of, you know, how do we make sure that we have 
actually better security in the cloud. That is, that is one of those return on investments that we wanna make sure we're focused on. So one of the ways to do it is to take advantage of all of the scalable um, infrastructure they've created to support IT security within the cloud environment. And then in our next generation systems, we're embedding more security into the code um, to make it so that we also have more secure code that we're, we're encrypting um, at, a, at a lower level. And then on top of that, we have the ability to employ our own technologies on top of the cloud cloud provider technologies for specialized areas of IT security that we think are really important to the market. So all of those together, I think will create a highly secured environment. And how long until we no longer even need physical exchanges at all, right? So when we migrate all the software to the cloud, will there be a physical NASDAQ? Well, I mean, we've actually always operated in a virtual world since we were launched in 1971. So we've never had a trading floor. Um, we've never had people running around with tickets in their hands. Um, we've always operated in an electronic manner. And that, I mean, NASDAQ was created to essentially democratize the capital markets. We, we wanted to make it so that if you were in California or you were in Idaho, you had just as much access to the markets as if you were in New York. And that was the original premise of NASDAQ back in 1971. And we used what was then very advanced technology. Today, it's obviously gone global, it's gone scalable. All of the markets, frankly, for the most part are electronic and there's very little that occurs in a, in a physical location as a market. Now, of course, the, the firms, our clients still have trading floors and they still have you know, people who are supporting order flow and all of those great things and they're doing that for clients. I think that that um, will continue, but they also have more electronic means to interact with the markets than they've ever had before. Okay, great. Let's talk about the second thing you mentioned when I asked you the 27 year question, which is, you know, the role of machine learning and how you build your software in the way that people trade and the way that you provide security in the way people trade. You've recently made an important and large acquisition. Why don't we start by you explaining what that is and why? Yeah, well, one of the key roles that exchanges have is to ensure integrity of the markets. And that really comes with another technology challenge, which is making sure that you can root out market manipulation, insider trading, and other nefarious behaviors that are occurring within the markets. And NASDAQ actually has, ha has a scale technology that we provide to 50 exchanges, 12 regulators, and actually almost, almost 200 market participants today to help them manage through those types of risks. And we have been introducing machine learning into um, the alerting capability to be faster and identifying new patterns, uh, taking down or um, driving down some of the false positives. And so when you are in fact investigating a situation, it's more likely that it is in fact a pattern that you need to pay attention to. So that's an early stage use of, of machine learning within what we currently have. Last week, we also announced that we'll be acquiring Verifin, which is a full service provider of um, uh, anti-financial crime technology to banks looking at fraud and, and money laundering. And so when going forward, we'll have the full range of capabilities now to be able to provide to banks and brokers to support their anti-financial crime um, the activities, which by the way, they spend $12 billion a year on technology and $42 billion a year total to, to try to manage through, um, you know, ma uh, manage out financial crime. So this is a huge, huge market. And machine learning has actually always been a part of what Verifin does. They have introduced it early on to, to really help with making the alerting smarter, finding network patterns across banks, because in the US there is an information sharing agreement that allows banks to manage um, or look across banking platforms to root out crime. And so I think that they've always leveraged machine learning as part of what they do. And then on top of that, we now have a surveillance. So we're a full service provider going forward. And where is the data? So one of the one of the constant trade-offs in machine learning as we think about it across different sectors is that the more data the machine learning system has, the faster it can learn, the better the software can get. But of mm -hmm. course, to feed that data in, you sometimes require it from private customers who may not want to give it to you, or it may, you know, not be sufficiently anonymized. There are a lot of complicated trade-offs in this mix between efficiency and privacy. You could presumably, sitting in the middle of all these transactions, working with all these companies, have nearly infinite data. But how do you think about the trade-offs between efficiency and privacy with your, with your customers? Like what data will you use? What data will you not? Yeah, so I think that it's important to recognize that when it comes to 
identifying crime. So fraud schemes, money laundering schemes, there is a network effect that you have to be able to, to employ. And the more, as you said, if you can look at data across 2000 banks, which is the, the client base of Verifin versus just looking at the data within one bank, you're gonna be much more equipped to be able to find those patterns of behavior, to be able to look at the network effect and how a, a criminal may be leveraging multiple banks in order to manage their activity. So that's why um, in the US there is something called uh, 314B, which is a law that allows the banks to share information for a very specific purpose. And that is what Verifin does. So they allow for that information to be used and it can be um, you know, identifiable information because it could be, for instance, if they, they do a thing where they, they scour um, phone books and they look for phone numbers that are associated with certain institute, you know, organizations. Let's say it's a, um, you know, something that's related to prostitution or something like that. And then they can look at account openings to see whether anyone leverages that phone number. So that, that's an example of how they, they leverage data across um, different means to, to try to root out and find um, people who might have, you know, a criminal history or they might have um, certain information that, that can help identify them. So I, it, is, it is a very sensitive thing. This is the data actually really sits inside the banking systems and they tie into the banking systems to, to, to look for a very specific thing, but this, that the data always resides and sits within the banking systems. It doesn't get kind of culminated in a way that, um, that can be, you know, that Verifin is using it in a way that other than to identify crime. All right, okay, well, let's, um, let's hope that you're able to strike this balance of privacy and efficiency while also staying ahead of the, uh, of the people committing the financial crimes. Let me talk about a slightly different angle on machine learning, which is of course algorithmic trading. What percent of the transactions that you manage are done by algorithmic traders right now? And what percent do you think will be in say five years? Yeah, I don't think we have a specific percentage of trading that's done by algorithmic traders. The thing that I always say is it's the, you know, the order flow that comes in is generally generated, let's say by a machine but the, the humans behind the machine are making the determinations as to what are the signals that they're using in order to drive that order flow. And so if we look at the really, really busy times in March where we had a, a lot of, obviously a lot of disruption in the market and we had a lot of days where we had high volatility, I think that I always say that that was driven by human sentiment. No doubt about it. Now, how they directed that that human sentiment into the markets, they might have just put in orders themselves, type them right in, like I did as a you know as a you know if if I'm an individual investor and I um, want to buy an ETF, then I can go in and make a human decision and make a human order, put an order in. But there are others that um, will take those sentiments and then determine how they want to manage the order flow, and then they'll they'll code a machine in order to make it so that that sentiment is reflected in the market. So you have kind of a combination of everything, um, human decisions and machine-driven machi uh, decisions, though, that, that reflect the human sentiment. And that's really what happened in March. Right. But in the future, do you think that, you know, there are lots of institutional investors who say, well, let's buy this and let's not buy that and let's wait it this way and we'll hedge here. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of people, right? A number of very famous companies that actually have, you know, black box algorithms or nearly black box algorithms. Mm -hmm. In the future, do you think the majority will be black box algorithms? How, how quickly are we heading towards that moment? Because it's I, a I would say that it's still very niche. I mean, I, there yeah. certainly are some players that use only uh, machine learning and, and they have their own, they have a strategy they're trying to deploy and then they let the machines deploy it, right? They make, right. they'll let them, they use machine learning to allow the, the machines to deploy that strategy and learn from that strategy and, and adjust the strategy. That's still very niche right now. That's a very small part of the market today. Um, recognizing that, you know, the, the investable capital across the world is you know, $70 trillion. So, so in, in the world of investable capital, it's, very, it's still very small. In 27 years, do I think the majority will be that way? I don't know, actually, because, because I actually think that if you have, I've always said that if you have everyone move into that world, then you have this like massive herd mentality, right? And, and it's, it gives the humans much more opportunity to arbitrage. So I think there's always gonna be a balance between the humans coming in and making judgment, you know, creative decisions, judge, judgment decisions, and also machines coming in and making algorithmic decisions. And, and that balance is what, is what makes the markets great. Huh, that's an that's a interesting way to put it. I haven't thought of so many algorithmic traders that are coming in that there's actually more room, more room for humans. That is an optimistic view of the role that humans will play in the world in the future.
Let me let me I ask think you about that, the you know, but, but I think people have to recognize that there's a lot of creativity that goes into the markets. And when you think about what is the role of a human going forward, it's about creative spirit, judgment. It's all the things that it's hard to code into a machine. And yeah. the markets have a lot of that. I mean, they reflect a lot of human judgment, a lot of creativity. And that I think is going to be very hard to replace with a machine. So it's striking that balance and maintaining that balance that's going to be important. Yeah. All right. So our robot overlords are at least 28 years away. Um, next question. <laughs> exactly. In the intro, you mentioned three things. We've gone through two. The third is quantum computing. Um, that would be, I think, the one of the three things that will take more than five years to come. But what is NASDAQ's role in preparing for a future in which quantum machines may or may not be vastly faster and more efficient than classical machines? Well, I, I think that the, the promise of quantum is elusive, right? So it's, it's one where we're watching it very carefully. We're starting to see that there are some experiments that are working. And, and yet at the same time, it's very hard to code against, right? So it's not right. a language that's easy to, to implement. But if you say 27 years from now, I think that we're gonna get much further down the road. So, so that means that there could be an opportunity to use a machine that basically can simulate thousands of outcomes in a, in a second and to find you the right path to be able to deploy your strategy among those thousands of different ways that you could go into the market and deploy a strategy, this is the best one. This is the one that's gonna give you the best outcome. If, if quantum computing has the capability of doing that in the next 27 years, I actually think you'll see more, more of that. You, you asked about you know, more algorithmically driven investment decision-making. I think that would be a catalyst for that. And, and I think that it also, uh, you know, theoretically could create perfectly efficient markets, which is, uh, again, an elusive nirvana that people talk about. Um, but I also think that it's something where, again, I'm not so sure that the quantum computer will ever be able to um, replicate the judgment of a human. Is NASDAQ trying to build its own quantum computer? Uh, you know, but there are lots of great companies out there who are doing that themselves. So we'll we'll just be basically partner with them when they've got it all perfected, and we'll be right. Now, one of the things we actually are focused on is is working with some of the the firms that are focused on quantum to see how we can bring that into the surveillance and the anti financial crime space. Because the faster we're able to bring that in, the better defenses we'll have when when those you know, some bad actors might end up getting access to one in the future. So we want to make sure we're kind of on the forefront of it. From a defensive perspective, so that we can defend against others using it in the bad in a bad way. Um, that makes sense, and I'll say the same is true of Wired Magazine right now. But if someone wants to give me two billion dollars, I would absolutely invest in a quantum computer development company or project inside of Wired. So yes, um, let me ask you about one other big tech topic, just so we can cover all the things that people might search for while going through this conference. How does Nasdaq plan on deploying blockchain as a potential solution to a subset of problems that some of your customers might have? Yeah, so I, I would say for a while now, I think a lot of people have viewed the blockchain as a solution looking for a problem, right? So, and, and I think that- Phrase the question so narrowly. <laughs> So I think that, uh, and, and what we've been able to find is that there are ways to leverage the blockchain. If you're launching a new market and you're trying to establish demand and you're working on creating an ecosystem around that market, the blockchain actually is a very modern way for you to be able to establish an immutable record of transfers and to make it so that you have a very modern and easy way to settle out trades. So you have the ability to do, in a way, pre-trade risk management in a very eff efficient, effective way, and then take it all through all the way through settlement, and you could settle, you know, in ten minutes. You don't have to wait two days, which is happens in the U.S. markets today. So, I do think that for new markets that are not latency sensitive, that also are are frankly not high volume, I think the blockchain actually is a modern way to create a market, and we've actually integrated certain blockchain technologies into our next generation trading system, and we are launching markets with the blockchain embedded. But that, but if you want to try to apply it to the most established markets, those that have super high volumes, low latency environments, um, and are highly regulated and are in, in, integrated into a lot of banking systems that for, in many cases are not the most modern, it's a very hard challenge. And then you have yeah. to say, well, what's the benefit of that? Like, what do they get out of it? Well, you can shorten settlement cycles um, and that's, that's relevant because it, it definitely takes some risk capital out of the banks. Um, but I also would say that it's it's a big investment to make. And so these are the types of big decisions that I, I'm not sure the industry on a whole has decided to make yet. And I think having more successful experiments 
and a successful production experiences with new markets, I think we'll give more and more confidence to try to uh, apply this to the more established markets over time. Um, that does make sense to me. All right, let me ask you about a big question that you've spoken and written about. You've said that you see a backlash to capitalism building and you see it not abating. Where do you see the backlash to capitalism right now and what do you think happens next? Well, I think that that's, first of all, I have, I, you know, I look at things through a lens of a U.S. experience. So, I, you know, my, my comments have focused mostly on the U.S. in terms of looking at the environment that's developed over the last, frankly, 10 years. So, you know, when I mm -hmm. came into NASDAQ back in the, the mid-90s, I, I guess I never expected that I'd be sitting here in 2020 defending the, the notion of capitalism. Um, so I think that the, the reason for that is, while I'm a big believer that capitalism as a concept is the best way to unlock human potential. I mean, I really do believe that. You, yeah. you, know, you provide opportunity to people, they work hard, they get access to money, they can then take that money, um, turn their idea into a reality, hire people and create job creation as well as economic uh, growth. So it's a, it's a very good concept. The issue is that we have not been able to make that opportunity available to all. And so we have, from an you know, how have we executed capitalism in the U.S.? I think we have work to do to really uh, lay the foundation within the broader society to make it so that opportunity is in fact available to all. Doesn't mean everyone's going to take advantage of it. Doesn't mean everyone's going to succeed. But it, making it so that you've choked off that opportunity to parts of the population has made it so that we therefore have not really maximize the potential of what capitalism can create and it's created that backlash. So I'd like to see more time spent by the US government and by private enterprise working together to solve some of the, the bigger issues around how do we make opportunity more available? How do we make education more um, equal across the country? How do we make it so that then people have more of a chance to find, um, find an idea, find a network of people who are able to fund that idea have the banking system, um, you know, kind of more propagated into some of the smaller populated um, parts of the country so that they have access to debt capital and they can then use a network of people to help them um, raise and, and launch their business. So those are the types of things that we have to get better at in order to make it so that capitalism is available and accessible to everyone here. And, and I think there's work to do there. So that's the idea of that stakeholder capitalism um, and having companies also think more broadly about what their role is in the communities around them. Well, let's let's talk about that for a second. So companies should think more broadly about their role in the communities around them. Stakeholder capitalism, probably everybody who's watched this is familiar with that term. Do you think that companies should be required to report their ESG data? Um, I mean, every actually around the world of different governments are making different decisions around that. And in fact, in Singapore, I think they've been pretty much on, they've been more on the forefront of thinking about how to how to make more disclosures available on ESG stats. And Singapore, frankly, is, is a world leader on the ESG front, particularly on the sustainability side. So it'll be interesting to see how Singapore addresses the issue because they tend to be a leader in that area. Same with the Nordics, the Nordic countries, and we um, own and operate most of the exchanges in the Nordic countries are very forward thinking in terms of ESG. So we have actually provided in the Nordics um, a list of data that we we suggest and encourage our, our companies to provide to the exchange, but we don't require it. But we still have hundreds of companies who are actually submitting that data, which gives investors a much better sense of, and the ability to compare and contrast companies in terms of their progress on their ESG um, initiatives. So I don't know whether it needs to be required or whether it's just by the notion of exchanges promoting it, for one, then investors demanding it, um, from the companies, and then, frankly, allowing the ecosystem around us through capitalism to, to come up with different metrics and ways to start to standardize and modernize the way that people are, um, what kind of data is, is most important to be submitted and how we submit it. So right now, I'm, I'm not so sure it needs to be regulatorily mandated, but more that the investor pressure, the exchanges encouragement and technology around us will create more standardization and make it, make it frankly, a de facto way of life for companies as opposed to a regulatory mandate. That makes a lot of sense. So people should follow the example of the government of Singapore. The NASDAQ should play a role in the center of this, but it doesn't need to be a government regulation. That is a marvelous note to end on. Thank you very much, Adina Friedman. It was a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much.